the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia for the Veterans Project for the Library of Congress. And today we're privileged to have with us Ivan Ike Struensee. I met Mr. Struensee the first time back in August when we, I was a patient at Piedmont Hospital along with his wife and we both had surgery and I noticed that there was this very attentive husband in the hall always there to take care of his wife and I got to talking to him and he didn't sound like he was from Thomasville, Georgia. It turns out he was from <laughs> upstate New York and had lived in Erie, Pennsylvania and moved to Atlanta after falling in love with a pretty young Georgia girl or southern girl and it turns out he was a veteran of World War II so I asked him if he had come and be interviewed and he agreed to do so so we're delighted to have you with us today Ike and I want you to start off as we discuss and just tell us a little about yourself. Well thank you. Well I uh I'm Mike Struncy. I was uh, born in uh, upstate New York, Amsterdam, New York, in May of 1923, and uh, we lived through the Depression. I loved the out of doors as I was growing up. I uh, was out most of the time all winter long. The colder the better. Just come home long enough to get a warm bowl of soup that my mother always had on the back of the stove and dry out a little bit. And I, uh, during the Depression, I say, my father didn't have much work, but I didn't notice it as a child. I, we had everything that we seemed to need. Our clothes probably weren't the newest there were, but we weren't cold. And I, uh, graduated from high school as a class officer in June of 1941. And uh, our guidance teacher, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew getting out of school in 41 and with the conditions as they were in Europe, I knew basically where I'd be going, where we'd all be going, young men of my age. and. Uh, our guidance counselor told me that since I was secretary treasurer of our class and I handled money and stuff like that, and kept up with details, and she suggested I study accounting. So uh, I went to the Bentley School of Accounting and Finance in Boston, Massachusetts in September of 41, and uh, I liked it. And uh, it was strictly accounting. We didn't, there was no campus. The school was right on the main street in Boston, Back Bay. We had accounting five days a week, five hours a day. And, uh, but anyway, on uh, the evening of December 7, 1941, I was in my room, which was on, for you, people familiar with Boston. It was on uh, Newbury Street in Back Bay, Boston. And uh, I was in a, one of these walk-ups and our room was, my roommate and I had a room on the top floor of this, this rooming house. And of course there were several Bentley students who lived there also. It was within walking distance of the school. But on this Sunday afternoon of December 7th, I uh, was doing my homework. We had lots of homework. And uh, I was sitting there and I had a little radio. Back in those days, we didn't have television. We had, I had a little radio that I brought from home and I had it on the corner of my desk over there as I was doing homework. And this news bulletin came on that Pearl Harbor had been bombed or attacked. And not many of us Students knew, not even knew what Pearl Harbor was, or where it was, or who it was, or we didn't, we didn't know Pearl Harbor. But we later found out that uh, it was where our Pacific fleet was stored, and, and essentially uh, we were attacked by Japan, and uh, which was bad. So that's where I was in December of uh, 41 at Pearl Harbor. I was 18 years of age at the time, and uh, I was able to finish school that, that year. Came home in June of 42, and I had, then I had just turned 19. 
then I had a part-time job during the summer because I needed cash. As I say, this was right after Depression, and to go to college, you needed money. So I had to work that summer and save my money so I could go back. And also, I got a nine months deferment at that time. If you were in college, I guess you could get one nine month or one six month deferment from the draft. One. So I got a deferment from September to February, I guess, of 43. And then my deferment was up. And I was still back in Boston in school. By then, I could see the changes that were taking place in Boston because Boston, being a port city, there was a lot of naval activity going on. And uh, a lot of dignitaries who had been called up in the service were living in Boston in some of the downtown hotels. And, uh, we had uh, blackouts because uh, by then, of course, we were at war with Germany. And Boston faces that North Atlantic, and there were always threats of, of being attacked on the East Coast. So we, we had to endure many blackouts in, in that time of the year or in those years, let's say. But anyway, I had to come home in February of 43 because my draft board was calling me. And uh, I took my exam, and believe it, listen to this. I, uh, I went down to Albany, New York. That's where Amsterdam was, about 32 miles from Albany. And we had to go to Albany to get our physicals. And uh, I went down there this one morning, or one day, to take a physical, and I felt great. I was only, what, 19 years old. I felt great. But they told me I had the three-day measles. Now, I don't know if a few folks are familiar with the three-day measles or not, but I evidently my shoulders and my chest were broken out. With, like with a, They were broken out. And I guess I was running a little fever. And these things only lasted three days. And they classified me 4F, which meant I was physically unfit for the service. And I begged them to let me go because the deal was you take your physical this day and you weren't called up until two weeks down the road. You had two weeks in there to prepare your business and get ready to ship off. Ship off. And I told them that in two weeks, in two weeks' time, all this would be cleared up and I'd be I'd be okay. I didn't even know I was supposed to be sick. But anyway, they said, take your time, take your time. We'll get you next month. So here I was at home, and I had to wait another month. It was too big. No point in going back to Boston. So I went to work for the county. I worked on the county roads with a pick and shovel. And you know, upstate New York, in the winter, the roads get torn up from the ice. So there were a lot of potholes that had to be filled in the county. So I spent a month, six weeks, pounding, pounding down blacktop to fill these holes. And then I went into service. I went to Camp, uh, oh, down on Long Island, forgot the name, Camp Shanks on Long Island. And I uh, was there a few days, learned something, learned about KP. And, uh, and then we shipped out. And, uh, I, along with a lot of other young men from upstate New York, we uh, went down to Camp Stewart, Georgia. Uh, it's presently called Fort Stewart, but back then it was it was just a camp. And this was down near, uh, well, it's down in the area in the vicinity of Savannah, Georgia, southeast Georgia. And that's where I took my basic training in the AA, the Anti-Aircraft Artillery. And uh, our, we, we, learned, we learned how to shoot a rifle and all that, and how to march and salute and do all that, but our primary equipment was a 40 millimeter anti-aircraft gun and a, and a director and a power plant. 
and uh, our job was to uh, follow the Marines, I guess, follow the Marines as they were taking these islands in the Pacific. We'd go in right after the Marines and, and guard the air base from future attack from the enemy. Or even guard our coastland because at that time, this was early 43, at that time our coasts were still subjected to uh, enemy attack. And we thought, anyway. I guess there were some U-boats sighted down off the coast of Georgia and around. But anyway, I spent about a year at, uh, in, in uh, Camp Stewart. And then in about September of 44, they took all of our... By, oh, by then I was a sergeant. I got promoted to sergeant three months after I was in the service. And I was in charge of a section crew of the anti-aircraft. There were 15 men in a section. But anyway... In September of 44, they took all the men out of our outfit from corporals on down and shipped them out to this GBI, the China, Burma, India, CBI. And uh, those of us who were left, sergeants and above, we had the good fortune to be transferred to Camp Gordon, Georgia, in September of 44 for infantry training infantry training. Now this is after September 44, this is after D-Day of course. But anyway, we were up there for seven or eight weeks of infantry training and guess what? We completed our infantry training in December of 1944 about the same day as the Battle of the Bulge started. And of course infantry replacements were top priority in the European Theater of Operations, ETO. They were losing a lot of men, and they were looking for infantry replacements, of which I was one. So, it, uh, it, they moved us in a hurry. Uh, it only, in 12 days time, I tell this people, in 12 days time, I went from Camp Gordon, Georgia, on up through uh, uh, on up to Washington at Camp So, I forgot the name of it, it still exists, where they checked our, all of our records, made sure our records were in order, and issued us winter clothing, and made sure our, uh, we made our, uh, if we had any deductions, sending money home, you know, we wouldn't need much money over in Europe. So most of our pay was allotted to our home. And, and then from, from that camp, we went on up to Camp Shanks, which was a re depot, what do they call it, embarkation point, just above New York City. And then from there, we spent one night up there and came down and got on to Queen Elizabeth. Now, the Queen Elizabeth was the largest ship afloat at the time. There was a British ship. It had never been used for commercial traffic and went right into service transporting military. And um, there were 17,000 of us aboard the Queen Elizabeth. And this was early January 1945. And we sailed from New York and it only took us less than five days to go from New York to Glasgow, Scotland. We didn't have a, an escort because the Queen Elizabeth was too fast and no escorts could keep up with it. And I was told that they changed course every 15 minutes. The ship changed course so that no German U-boats that were patrolling the North Atlantic at that time could get a bead on us. So anyway, oh, something else about that it might be nice. Our battalion... As I said, there were 17,000 troops aboard, and our battalion was on KP duty for the whole trip. And they took, from, I was a buck sergeant at the time, and buck sergeants on down had to, had to be on KP. Now, for you that don't know what KP is, kitchen police. And uh, the conditions aboard ship were deplorable. Uh, we were, they stashed bodies, or bodies, 
soldiers every place. They'd clear out a, a room and stash uh, uh, bunks about 18 inches apart and they'd stash them clear to the ceiling so there'd be as many as seven men in a pile in all these rooms uh, on board ship. In the ballrooms, they'd cleaned out the swimming pools aboard ship and they were sleeping down there. GIs were all over. Of course, the ship itself, it wasn't like it usually is. They had boarded up. All the, the decks were all boarded up so that you couldn't see out. And they were all painted gray because the ship, you couldn't let any lights be seen out on the water at night. So everything had to be in. But anyway, they served us twice a day on board ship. The first meal started at 5.30 a.m. and lasted until 11 a.m. 11.30 a.m. And then the second meal started at 2.30 p.m. and went through 8.30 p.m. And of course, I, I was one of them on KP. And a lot of, most everyone on board was seasick. They couldn't leave their their bunks. They were vomiting all over the place. Most of our job on KP was just, this sounds bad, just mopping up the vomit on the floor. We had 55 gallon drums sitting all over because some of the guys would come down to eat and the, the food would get down there and it would come right back up. Awful. But I was working so hard I never got sick. And that was true of most of the fellows in our battalion, those that were working and didn't keep their mind on, they had other things to do, they never, we never got sick. So much for that. And then we were, we arrived in Glasgow, Scotland, and then we got on a troop train, and we went through England from Glasgow down to Southampton. And then in Southampton we boarded a Greek ship. Oh, it was, well, it was good was awful compared to the Queen Elizabeth. It was a little old tramp ship of some kind. And it took us almost as long to cross the English Channel as it did to cross the whole North Atlantic. Because by then we were in a convoy with several other ships and we had to take our time. And the food on board that ship was awful. Just awful. Uh, and we went, went from Southampton, England to Le Havre in France. And in France, when we hit there, I don't know what hour of the day it was, it was dark, it was cold, it was raining, it was always raining. But we had to get off the ship, form in a line and walk up to a top of a mountain that overlooked Le Havre. Up there was what they called a repel depot, a replacement depot. And this is where all the soldiers went. And we spent one night up there. Uh, we spent one night up there in freezing cold. We were in tents. Tents did have wooden floors in there, but sides were open. It rained, and you know how cold it, the rain is in January. It's part rain and part ice. And we were cold and wet. We didn't sleep. And at 5.30 the next morning, we had to fall out for roll call. They marched us back down off that mountain, down to the Lahar, and we had boarded 40 and 8 railroad cars. Now, 40 and 8, that goes way back to World War I, I guess. It's either, takes either, there's room for 40 people or 8 horses. That's what a 40 and 8 is. And we got on board these cars to go across northern France. And these cars, you, you enter from each side, and there were little compartments with three seats on one side and three seats on the other. So you'd sit facing three guys over there and three of us here. No heat in there, of course. And the floors of these cars were probably just little uh, half-inch wood floors, probably. And all this cold air outdoors there and everything, I, I, I actually froze my feet riding from Metz, the bottoms of my feet anyway, riding from, from La Harve over to the vicinity of Metz in uh, way up in northeastern in uh, France, Metz. And uh, 
we sat three across, and what we did, we'd lean on each other to sleep. And there'd be one person sitting in the side, and the other two would be leaning against them sleeping. And then every hour or so, we'd swap around, and the one that was sitting over there, he'd come down to the other side, and we'd slide over, and we'd lean on someone else for a while. And we did, they did feed us going across there a couple times. We had to get outside to eat. And, uh, but anyway, we eventually arrived in the town of Metz, which had just recently been taken by the 26th Yankee Division. Or they were a part of it, and it had been taken by the Third Army. And uh, we, they took us to this uh, uh, building out of well, what it had been used for, some sort of a military installation. And that was where I got my last hot meal in Metz. And would you believe, as I was standing after I got my hot meal and my mess kit, I went over and I stood against in a windowsill. That's, that was our table. We, I stood in the windowsill eating my food. And right next to me stood a man who was one of my high school classmates, Donald Stern. I hadn't seen him since I graduated from high school. And I don't know what happened to him or where he had been, but would you believe, out of, out of the blue, in Metz, France, eating our last hot meal, I stood with Donald Stern from Amsterdam, New York. But anyway, we left Metz shortly because then we were getting to the point where we were being funneled down to divisions and regiments and companies and platoons and squads. So when we left Metz, we were on foot. As I say, we'd have our last hot meal now. And the weather was constantly cold, rain, snow, no, no warmth whatsoever, no dry conditions. We were always on the go. We were always moving, always moving. And we, of course, by then we were on K rations. And, uh, and also by then, a lot of the fellas intestines and things started messing up. You know, when you go from hot food to cold food, you're inclined maybe to have diarrhea. So we'd have to stop a lot to take care of that problem and by the time you got all bundled up again and everything zipped up and buttoned up and your gloves on and everything, why ten minutes later you had to do it all over again. And and this was this was awful. Just awful. And for warmth, we would uh, try to look for tanks. Sometimes we would get in the vicinity of tanks and, and we'd stand by their exhaust and just stand back there and kind of warm up from the exhaust from, from tanks. Now I have this little prayer here that, that General Patton made that covers pretty much the... Uh, the conditions that existed at the time in the Ardennes, where most of the fellows were getting trench foot. This is from your feet being constantly cold, your socks being constantly wet, and no, they never dried out. And of course, I mentioned diarrhea. We were hungry. We were constantly hungry, and we always had on wet clothes. But this little poem, or not a poem, a prayer that General Patton actually made, so I'm told, in, at Christ, before Christmas 1944. May I read it? Certainly. All right, here it goes. Uh, this is a prayer now, and he's speaking to God. Sir, this is Patton talking. The last 14 days have been straight hell. Rain, snow, more rain, more snow. And I'm beginning to wonder what's going on. Your headquarters, whose side are you on anyway? For three years, my chaplains have been explaining this as a religious war. This, they tell me, is the Crusades all over again. Except that we're riding tanks instead of charges. They insist we are here to annihilate the German army and the godless Hitler so that religious freedom may return to Europe. 
Up until now I have gone along with them, for you have given us your unreserved cooperation. Clear skies and a calm sea in Africa made the landings highly successful and helped us to eliminate Rommel. Sicily was comparatively easy and you supplied excellent weather for our armored dash across France. The greatest military victory that you have thus far allowed me. You have often given me excellent guidance in difficult command decisions and you have led German units into traps that made their elimination fairly simple. But now you've made changed horses midstream. You seem to have given von Rundstedt every break in the book, and frankly he's been beating hell out of us. My army is neither trained nor equipped for winter warfare, and as you know, this weather is more suitable for Eskimos than for southern cavalrymen. But now, sir, I can't help but feel that I have offended you in some way that suddenly you have lost all sympathy with our cause, that you are throwing in with von Rundstedt and his paper-hanging God. You know without me telling you that our situation is desperate. Sure, I can tell my staff that everything is going according to plan, but there's no use telling you that my 101st Airborne is holding out against tremendous odds in Bastogne and that this continual storm is making it impossible to supply them even from the air. <clears throat> I've sent Hugh Gaffey, one of my ablest generals, with his 4th Armor Division north toward that all-important road center to relieve the encircled garrison. And he's finding your weather much more difficult than he is the Krauts. I don't like to complain unreasonably but my soldiers from the Moose to Echternach are suffering the tortures of the damned. Today I visited several hospitals, all full of frostbite cases, and the wounded are dying in the fields because they cannot be brought back for medical care. But this isn't the worst of the situation. Lack of visibility, continued rains have completely grounded my Air Force. My technique of battle calls for close-in fighter-bomber support, and if my places, if my planes can't fly, how can I use them as aerial artillery? Not only is this a deplorable situation, but worse yet, my reconnaissance planes haven't been in the air for 14 days, and I haven't the faintest idea of what's going on behind the German lines. Damn it, sir! I can't fight a shadow. Without your cooperation from a weather standpoint, I am deprived of an accurate disposition of the German armies. And how in hell can I be intelligent in my attack? All this probably sounds unreasonable to you, but I have lost all patience with your chaplains who insist that this is a typical Ardennes winter and that I must have faith. Faith and patience be damned. You have just got to make up your mind whose side you're on. You must come to my assistance so that I may dispatch the entire German army as a birthday present to your Prince of Peace. Sir, I have never been an unreasonable man. I am not going to ask you for the impossible. I do not even insist upon a miracle, for all I request is four days of clear weather. Give me four clear days so that my planes can fly, so that my fighter bombers can bomb and strafe, so that my reconnaissance may pick, up, pick out targets for my magnificent artillery. Give me four days of sunshine to dry this blasted mud so that my tanks may roll, so that ammunition and rations may be taken to my hungry, ill-equipped infantry. I need these four days to send von Rundstedt and his godless army to their Valhalla. I am sick of this unnecessary butchery of American youth and in exchange for four days of fighting weather. I will deliver you enough krauts to keep your bookkeepers months behind in their work. 
Amen. That was a, a, a prayer of General Patton. All right. And I mentioned in my talk here that it was good to see clear weather finally come about and uh, to be able to look up and see all these uh, uh, and trails of uh, vapor and trails in the sky as Allied bombers flew over us on their way to Germany to make our job easier. Now in the, in the Ardennes, Ardennes is a forest as we all know, it's hilly and it's dense. And our company commander, I was in Company L of the 328th Infantry Regiment in the 26th Yankee Division. And our company commander of Company L was a full-blooded Navajo Indian. So it always seemed that our company would, if we were had something to do, our company always had to go up through the woods and up the mountains and over the hills because I guess they figured our Indian captain would, would never get lost. While the other companies had the easier route through the on the roads, through the valleys, where we had to go up over the mountain tops to flush out the enemy. I went for four months without a bath, without a change of clothes. Uh, got kind of rough. But finally, oh, I guess in maybe March, why they came out with portable showers. So they'd pull us off the front lines, we all go to the rear, and they had these portable showers set up in tents. And you'd go in, you'd strip down to your birthday suit and take all your dirty clothes and throw them over in a pile and go in and take a hot shower and then when you got through you come out and they give you warm clean dry clothes to replace the ones you had removed. This felt good. Uh, some of my experiences well as we went through the finished going through the Ardennes cleaning out the Ardennes the Battle of the Bulge finally ended. We came down through the Saar, broken Saar lot area of Germany, Luxembourg. And then we, uh, we had to cross the Rhine because we still weren't in the heart of Germany. So we crossed the Rhine at Mainz. And I remember walking across a bridge that had been made by our engineers and all it was was a, a bunch of of metal drums that had been tied to lash together and they had wood on top of it and you just walked across on this wood across the Rhine River. And then in, in the, after Mainz our division sort of took a turn up to the northeast of Mainz and we started going through the industrial section of Germany and I remember one experience in a little town of Hanau which was a pretty good sized industrial town but in Hanau, our squad, of course the town was in ruin because it had been bombed so heavily by our Air Force. So there was a lot of just broken down buildings and a lot of glass, a lot of glass all over everything. And our squad was billeted, if you'd call it, in the cellar of, some, of a home. And on guard duty, we'd have to go up the cellar stairs and go up into the front room of this building. I don't know if it was a, an office, a business, or a residential home, but I, it had a front room. And all the windows were blown out, of course. But we'd have to stand up in the corner of this room behind the, the drapes, out of sight. Of course, there was no lights or anything, but we had to stay out. We couldn't make any shadows. And that was one of our guard posts while we were in Hanau. And of course the Germans were probably right across the street. We didn't know, you know, this was the, the German army was deteriorating them and there were stragglers and everything. So anyway, we had to be on duty. And that was scary standing in that front window at night and with all this glass out there and sometimes even a dog or a cat running on his glass made a noise and it would scare you to think there was someone approaching us. But, as I say, 
our squad was down in the cellar, only one staircase getting out of there. And of course, we had a candle, but we had covers over the cellar windows to block out, couldn't let ourselves be seen. And then one day, somewhere along in Germany, our platoon sergeant led us too far one day. I don't know if he got his orders screwed up or not, but we were on a little patrol and we were supposed to stop in a, in a railroad yard in some little town and we were not supposed to go beyond the line of railroad cars that were in the railroad yard. But for some reason, he let us go beyond the rail, beyond the cars and we went out into this sort of like a trough and there was homes up on that side and homes up on this side and we were going right down in a little trough and suddenly we were fired upon and the man standing, we, we got down in the ditch and to see what was going on and one of my GIs who was standing right next to me was hit right through the forehead and died just like that and he was that far away from me because we had gone too far. We should not have gone out in that trough. Uh, that was rough. And then another time we were going, we were in a home, I remember, and we were, you had to flush out all these homes because you've heard of the Hitler Jugend. They're youngsters, 14, 15 years of age. And of course they were born and had been raised all through the Hitler era and they were taught to handle rough firearms and they were too young to be in the German army at the time but they were still around the countryside and they were expert marksmen and uh, going through a house one day I don't know where it was in Germany but Sergeant Gold who was a squad leader and another squad in our platoon started to go up the stairs up to the second level and he got hit. Got hit because a young, a young kid was standing up there with a rifle and shot him just like that. Sergeant Gold in New York City. Uh, and then also during this time as we went through Germany up through uh, Hanau and Fulda and Seoul and stuff like that. We started to see German slave laborers along the roadways, just wandering. Now these slave laborers were people whose towns had been overrun early during the German Nazi uh, days and they had been, most of them were from down around Hungary, Romania, and all those eastern countries. And they had been brought into Germany to work in the factories in Germany to produce war materials. And these people, they were slave laborers. And they were just desperate. They didn't, they never had much to eat. And they worked all the time. But I remember one day, we came upon a group of these slave laborers, maybe it was six or eight, and they were eating a raw horse. The German army had horse-drawn artillery, and of course in their flight to flee, I guess some of the horses were killed, probably from some of our air, air, air raids, but there were dead horses laying alongside the roadways. And of course these slave laborers were just wandering. They had been freed from wherever they had been working and being kept and they were desperately hungry and they were eating raw horse meat right off the side of the horses. Uh, and of course here's another thing that I used to do. I can speak German. I studied German in high school. I'm German descent. So as we as the war wound down we'd pull up in these little villages in Germany and our company commander, they'd say, okay, we're going to spend the night here. So he'd have to pick certain places to put to station us for guard duty. We'd have to, you know, always be on guard. So my job at that time then was to go uh, with our company commander 
who was this full-blooded Indian, and the German Burgemeister. Now, the Burgemeister is the word for mayor. So I'd go around town, our company commander would say, we'd like to put one platoon over there in that house and one platoon up there, and I'd have to go around with the German Burgemeister, and he'd have to order the people, the, the, the GIs who want to stay here tonight, get out of the house, get out of the house. So that, I had a sort of prestigious job there to go around with the, with the German mayors. One night, oh yeah, here was one. One night, my squad, in my squad I had a country boy from Iowa. I, I forgot his name, but he was a country boy, born up on a, born on a farm in Iowa. And we were spending this night in this German house, and there was this lone, straggly looking cow in the backyard. Real thin, real sickly looking. And guess what? We had steak that night. Our, our German, our, our boy from, uh, from uh, Iowa uh, slaughtered that cow, and I don't know how we, where we got the heat to make the steaks, but we had steak, and also in this house we found, we came across some canned, it was a real well-to-do home, and we found, in the basement we found, or in the pantry, we found some canned black cherries, real nice, great big black cherries that had been canned. So that night we had steak and black cherries. It sure beat K rations. Uh, so we proceeded down through Germany here, over close to the Czech border, down through southeast Germany to Passau. And Passau is, uh, is right on the border between Germany and Austria. And we proceeded into Austria and as far as Linz, Linz, Austria. And of course, all the while this was going on, the Russians were coming in from the east, and we were coming this way, so, you know, we were bound to, to meet up somewhere in there. The Russians from this way, and GIs this way. So we held up in Linz, and Linz, of course, is right on the Danube River. Big city, big industrial city, had been. And this was probably late, April of 1945, and there was still resistance going on in Prague, Czechoslovakia. So our division crossed the Danube River at Linz and proceeded northward into Czechoslovakia on our way to Prague. And of course, as I say, the Russians were coming in from the southeast, headed for Prague also. But anyway, uh, on the 8th of May, 1945, of course, we got orders to hold up that the Germans had surrendered. So we were in a little farmhouse in Predslavica, Czechos Czechoslovakia. Over there they call it Czechoslovakia, in Predslavica. It was a little farmhouse, and that's where our platoon, our whole platoon was there about Oh, by then there was probably 25 of us in a platoon. There's supposed to be around 30 or more. But we spent two months in this little uh, farmhouse in Czechoslovakia. It was primitive because uh, you, this would be the kitchen. We'd be sitting here in the kitchen and you'd open that door over there and you were in the barn. And there's the animals right over there. Right outside that door would be the animals. And there was no commode. The commode would be a pot right over there in the corner. That was our commode. And we put up with this for two months as the Germans surrendered and came through our lines. The Hungarians that had been fighting with the Germans, they all came through our lines. But this town, Fredslavica, was in the general vicinity of Budweiss. And you know what Budweiss is. That's where the Budweiser beer originated in Budweiser, Czechoslovakia. So needless to say, we had a good time for those two months in Predslavica. Uh, there was plenty of beer. And they had. We went to some big, it must have been a municipal building, and up on the second floor they had like a big dance hall. And these Czechoslovakian women, I'm telling you, they were hard working, but they loved to dance. And uh, they'd work in the fields all day long, farm work, farm work. They had 
I had arms on them like a man. And uh, they wore shoes out of this world. But anyway, they'd work in the fields all day long, tended to animals and harvesting grain and all that stuff. And then in the evenings, they'd come to this room up there and we'd dance. And they could dance. I don't know where they got the energy. But after having worked in the fields all day, they could dance away half the night as we were drinking Budweiser. That was pretty good. Okay, then we're getting down. All right. Then in late July, they sent our division back to Germany to take uh, infantry training, jungle training. Excuse me, I. Yeah. <clears throat> there was something about meeting up with the <clears throat> Russian troops in your name that gave you a special identity with them. That's coming up. All right. That's coming. That's my last <clears throat> thing here. All right. Dave, that's my last thing. I'm almost there. But anyway, we were sent back into Germany to, uh, to get to start training. Our, the plan was our division would go by way of the states. We'd have a 30-day furlough in the states, and then we'd report to the west coast, and we'd take off across the Pacific. And the plan was that we would be part of a Japanese invasion scheduled for November 1, 1945. So we went back into Germany and uh, in tents, living out in the woods. And of course, then we got to shave. I hadn't shaved in I don't know how long. And the dentist was there. Oh, I remember that. Let me tell you this story. They started checking. I don't know if I had a toothache or what, but they started checking around. They decided that I had lost a filling in one of my teeth or I needed a filling anyway. So I was slated for the dentist. And uh, the dentist came. And he had a, a, a PFC was with him. The PFC drove his Jeep and set up his equipment. Now, we were out in the fields, right out in the woods. And this thing, they had a, I don't know how many ever remember the old time sewing machines with a treadle where you'd sit there and you'd treadle like this to, to make your sewing machine go around so that you could sew. Well this this PFC had a treadle and he and that's how that's how he made power for the drill to drill out my tooth. He was sitting over there treadling away as a dentist was drilling out my tooth. But I got a filling in and I I don't know, I may still have it. I don't know. But anyway. But then after this, oh, while we were there in, in Germany, late, late March, late July, early August, 45, we all know what happened then. We dropped, an, we, the United States, dropped an atom bomb on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the war ended in the Pacific. So, our plans changed. So they sent our division back to Linz to be on occupation duty. And of course, occupation duty. All right, we had my, our platoon had guard duty on the rail, on the railroad bridge across the Danube, and by then the sectors had been set up, the things that had been determined, I guess, in the Potsdam Convention by the leaders, who was going to be stationed here, the Russians here, the Americans here, and someone else up there, and how the Europe was split up. Well, anyway. On the other side of the Danube River in Czechoslovakia was Russian territory. And then just a little to the east of Linz, long before you get to Vienna, that, those were all Russians down in there. So we were way over on the far eastern side of the American sector. But anyway, we had guard duty on the railroad bridge going across the Danube. And, and we had two of us GIs, so I, I was a, I never did the guard duty, I would probably be sergeant of the guard, but we had two of our men on the, on the Russian side of the river and two, two Russians over there. So there'd be four, four guards on each side of the railroad bridge. Two Russians over there and two Russians over here. Two Americans over there and two Americans over here. And this is the way it went on two hour shifts. By then, the Red Cross was in downtown, in a downtown hotel in Linz, and uh, this was nice. We could uh, have, they had donuts, coffee. You could write, had stuff to read. 
And then I want to tell you, one of the big jobs after the war in Linz was to take care of these people whom I mentioned earlier, these displaced persons. All these people, as the war ended, all these people had to get back to their homeland. So in about September, I guess it was, in the fall of the year, September, early October, it was in the fall, I was, I was a staff sergeant and I was put in charge of a displacement person train. Myself and I had four GIs with me. So there were five of us GIs. And we were in charge of this train load of displaced persons. 2,500 in all. Most of whom were women, children, and old men. And, and our job was to be in charge of the train. And it, the train was to go down to a town by the name of Vienna Neustadt which is about 70 miles, 60 or 70 miles southeast of Vienna, down, way down near Hungary. Probably was in Hungary, I don't know. But anyway, most of these 2,500 people came from that part of the world. So this train, we had a car ourselves, uh, our, our, the five of us GI'd, we had army cots, five cots in a car, and, and uh, we had lots of room. But we left out in the afternoon, maybe 2, 2.30 in the afternoon, and we headed for Vienna Neustadt. And we got to Vienna along about 4.30 or so, 5 o'clock. And it was in the fall of the year, so did the, I guess this had already been arranged before. But anyway, we decided we were going to spend the night in the railroad yard in Vienna. And then we'd proceed to Vienna Neustadt in the morning. So we were to spend the night in the Vienna Railroad Yard. I thought, that's okay, I can live with this. But, about 30 minutes later, from the east, here comes a troop train of Russian soldiers. And they were coming to the sector there in Austria to do occupation duty. And they were also going to spend the night in the railroad yard in Vienna. A whole train load of Russian soldiers, many of whom had never seen Americans before, much less Americans with, with weapons, because each one of us had, a, had an M1 or a carbine, I think I even had a pistol. But these Russians came in there, and these Russians were tough. I mean, they'd been fighting a long time. They'd never seen Americans before, and I hated to think what was going to happen with all those women that I had on this train. But I knew we were going to, the two of us, we were, we were all going to spend the night in the railroad yard. And I thought, wow, how am I going to get through this? But anyway, we gradually got to talking with them, and as I say, I can speak German. And these Russians had been in Germany a long time, so they could make out a few words of German. So we built a fire. It was, it was getting cold, you know, this time of the year. We had to have a little, we built a bonfire in the railroad yards between the trains. And we started talking. Well, I thought, wow, how, how is this going to happen? But anyway, my name, they call me Ike, but my real name is Ivan. And I started talking to the Russians, and in German I said, Mein Name ist Ivan. Ivan! Ah, oh, so! That Russian is Ivan. He's Ivan. He's Ivan. Every third or fourth Russian was named Ivan, because that's a, that's a big name in Russia. Ivan! That's how they pronounce Ivan in, over there. Ivan! So with my name being Ivan, and having had a few American-made cigarettes, we always got cigarettes in our K-rations, and I smoked then, I don't anymore. But we had some cigarettes, and my, by my name being Yvonne, we had no trouble whatsoever for the remainder of the night. And we proceeded on to uh, Vienna Neustadt in the morning, got unloaded all of these displaced persons, and the five of us GIs, made it back to Linz, and I was just thankful that my name is 
Elon. Thank you. Ike, we've got about four minutes left on this tape. What, <laughs> what lasting impressions from World War II, advice or thankfulness would you like to leave the future generations about your experiences in World War II and since? And well, I don't know. When I think back on it, I, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I kind of think we were, our age back then, our age group were better, the young folks were better disciplined, perhaps, than they are now. Of course, we didn't have as many things available to keep us from being undisciplined, I guess. But we, we seem to, you know, take orders, follow orders, and um, respect our leaders. And uh, we all seem to get along well. Or maybe we still do today. I don't know. But there seems to be so much squabbling this day and time and fussing and fighting. But anyway, I, I, uh, looking back on it, I'm, I'm glad I belong to, uh, to that generation of, of people. Okay. Where did you meet your wife after the oh, war? No, the I met, oh, no, I might tell you that. I met my wife uh, at Camp Stewart. Um, in those days, for you, who uh, knew, on, on Friday nights at the service, service club, they called it. It was a club, each, each army post had a service club. And, and on Friday nights, we'd have a dance from 8 to 11. And, uh, of course, in South Georgia, uh, uh, they they take the school bus and, and from and they go around and pick up all these young women who wanted to come to Camp Stewart to dance with us poor homesick GIs who could come say and my and uh, and that's how and, and all these women would come there and dance with us GIs and so therefore they find and we talk. And I discovered, or I found out about the town of Vidalia, Georgia. Vidalia, Georgia. They told me there was a wonderful hotel there, and it was a hotel with clean sheets. We weren't used to sheets in the Army there, but it had nice sheets. It was quiet, very few GIs, and it was nice. So I went to Vidalia, Georgia one weekend. Me and a couple of my buddies... And uh, I was standing on the main street in Vidalia, and of course in these little southern towns, on, as they say, on Saturday night, uh, business is never shut down. You know, as long as people were coming, as long as the farmers were coming in there with money, they, they, they stayed open. So I was standing there on a corner in Vidalia. What, are we running out of time? you got about a minute and a half left. Oh, I can do it. I can get it all in. Anyway, I was standing on the corner, and there were four women sitting in that car over there. And I don't know, my buddies, they, they got tired and they went back to the hotel. Well, that left me there by myself. And, and so finally we started a conversation. One of the girls in the car pretended she knew me and I picked up the fact and I made, I made like I knew her. So they finally invited, no, there were three girls in the car. They invited me over to sit with them. And they were waiting on two women to come get through work, and their daddy owned that department store, and they were working on Saturday. So finally those girls came out, so there were five females and myself in this car, and they drove me around by Delia to show me the sights. The cotton gin, the tobacco warehouse, the churches, the high school, and that was it. And then we went to the bus station, and they bought me a cup of coffee and took me back to the hotel. Well, there was one little girl in the back seat. She had these green eyes and red hair, and she didn't say a word, except I found out from the conversation that she worked for the ration board. Remember the ration board? She worked for the ration board, and she was Baptist. I didn't know then that 99% of the people were Baptist down here. But anyway, she was Baptist. She worked for the ration board. So I went back to the hotel, and I got up the next morning at 7 o'clock, and I called information. That was back before, you, if you dialed information, you got to talk to a person. And, and, uh, and I t called information, and I told her I needed some advice. I needed to know the phone number and name of such and such a person. And she gave me Helen Davis, 
and gave me the phone number. I called her and invited her to go to church with me, and the rest is history. You've been married how many years? Fifty-seven. Congratulations. And we're out of time. We're out of time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's fantastic.